The name of this channel is a play on the Latin proverb carpe diem, or seize the day. Turns out something was lost in translation because the phrase literally means pluck the day. Pluck is a harvest term, as in harvest the day because it's ripe with possibilities. This is the story of two games that span 161 years and two game giants who knew very well how to harvest the day. The Game of Life is next on Where's the Fun From? If you've ever wondered where your favorite toy or game came from, then you're in the right place. Be sure to subscribe because your subscription helps us to curate the greatest playthings ever designed and the playmakers who brought them to life. Milton Bradley's life was certainly full. He was a draftsman, lithographer, publisher, and educator. In 1860, he founded the company that bears his name when he created the Checkered Game of Life. The goal of the game was to proceed square to square from infancy to happy old age. The game was similar to an Indian game called Gayan Shapur, or as it came to be known in British India, Snakes and Ladders. In the checkered game of life, if you land on spaces like ambition or perseverance, you move forward toward contented senior citizenship. Land on spaces like gambling or idleness, and you move backwards. Milton Bradley was anything but idle. With his game in tow, he traveled from his hometown of Springfield, Massachusetts, to New York City, selling it to shopkeepers near and far. Before he was done, he sold 40,000 copies of his game and turned Milton Bradley Company into a bona fide player in the board game business. The checkered game of life was updated in 1866, the 1870s, and one last time in 1911, the same year that Milton Bradley died. It was on the market for over 50 years, but as times changed, game companies started to enter the realm of entertainment, forsaking the moral lessons that early American games preached through play. With the phenomenal success of games like Monopoly, where the goal was to bankrupt all your opponents and emerge the wealthiest, the era of fun games officially arrived. The checkered game of life, with its overt ethics, was taken off the market sometime in the 1920s. Meanwhile, in 1922, in Canton, Ohio, Reuben Klamer was born. His father bought and resold barrels, passing his entrepreneurial gene on to his son. Reuben studied business and engineering before World War II erupted in 1941. He decided to go to the United States Naval Reserve Midshipman School in Chicago and graduated from there in 1943. He was just 21 years old when he served in World War II as a combat officer and was a part of the U.S. Navy's amphibious landing forces in the Pacific. Following the war, he opened his own advertising agency before joining the Ideal Toy and Novelty Company as a salesman in 1949. Two years later, when he became the national sales manager for Eldon Industries, he began his foray into the realm of product development in earnest. One of Rubin's major contributions was pioneering the use of a new unbreakable plastic called polyethylene for toys, making play much safer for children of that era. He created special effects props for the Man From U.N.C.L.E. television show, and even a phaser rifle for Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek. This original one-of-a-kind prop just went up for auction last week at Heritage Auctions. The auction includes a letter from Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry to Reuben and photos of William Shatner, Captain Kirk himself, wielding the futuristic weapon. There's a link to the auction in the description of this video below. Ruben's biggest toy credits include Fisher Price's Preschool Trainer Skates, The Talking Viewmaster, Moon Rocks, and Gaylord the Walking Dog. But no other Ruben Klamer plaything resonated quite like the game of life. 
In June of 1959, Reuben flew to Milton Bradley to meet with James Shea Jr. to pitch him an art concept. Shea passed on the idea, but shared with Reuben that what he really needed was a game to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Milton Bradley. Reuben thought about it and the next day asked to see the Milton Bradley archives. There, he came upon the checkered game of life, and that word life energized him, and he decided to create a game with that as its theme. After all, Reuben thought, the market for such a game was everyone on Earth. Rubin's design was executed by a team of artists, which included Bill Markham, Leonard Israel, and Grace Chambers. In this rare photograph of the game's prototype, you can see mountains, buildings, water towers, houses, the classic hillside spinner, and even bridges. Trouble was, it was too expensive. Milton Bradley's production team worked with Reuben, who had more experience than the game giant when it came to plastics, to remove several of those elements. Yet the final product remained true to Reuben's vision, with rolling hills, tall buildings, and the classic Wheel of Fate spinner. Even the smiling face of a charming TV host on the cover was Reuben's idea. When the Whammo hula hoop craze hit in 1958, Reuben had teamed up with television personality Art Linkletter to create a company called Link Research to produce the spin a hoop, successfully competing with Whammo to feed the craze. Two years later, when the Game of Life was about to come out, Link Letter's popularity had only grown. In 1960, he was the host of two TV game shows, People Are Funny on NBC and House Party on CBS. It was a marketing coup to have him as the spokesman for the Game of Life. The Game of Life debuted at the 1960 International Toy Fair in New York City just in time for the centennial celebration of Milton Bradley. The showroom featured a replica toy store from 1860 and Milton Bradley's new centennial game, The Game of Life. Retailers loved it, and soon Milton Bradley was touting their new 3D game. Looking for some fun, my family and I gathered to play the first version of The Game of Life. In the world I've entered, plastic is just about everywhere. My church is made of plastic. All my children? Plastic. My boys are named Rod. My girls named Peg. All of a sudden, there are lawsuits. I go on probation, and my uncle goes to jail. The only thing laid on thicker than the one-inch plastic elements was the 60s glitz of gambling and tomfoolery. On various spaces on the board, you could win 50 grand in Vegas, 80 grand at the races, or get bamboozled out of 10 grand after buying a phony diamond from your best friend. But it wasn't a reflection of the time or even the 3D plastic elements that made this game classic, but something that Ruben knew from the start. Kids love to pretend to be grown-ups. While Monopoly provided the adult thrill of financial decisions, the Game of Life gave kids money choices and a glimpse into the adult world of insurance, having children, career choices, bank loans, and more. For kids, this newfound responsibility was liberating, and the fantasy downright fun. An indelible memory for me was when you spun the spinner too hard and it popped out of its hillside home. With Linkletter promoting it, the Game of Life became an immediate hit. Of course, this catchy TV ad didn't hurt either. The Game of Life, the Game, the game of Life, you will learn about life when you play the Game of Life. First you start up with 2,000, then a car. I got a car! You got a car. By 1966, the game was front and center in Milton Bradley's advertising. By 1970, when this ad appeared, life was second only to Parker Brothers' Monopoly in sales, making it one of the most successful games in the world. In Japan, it was called Jensi, and remains to this day one of the country's biggest selling games. That's life! In the 1990s, the game of life was updated. Instead of collecting $50,000 from a weekend in Vegas, you earn it after finding a solution for pollution. Over the years, Rubin encouraged the executives at Hasbro, which 
bought Milton Bradley in 1984 to continuously update the game to keep up with the changing times. Today's version of the game features pets, new careers, homes to buy, and plenty of the classic fun you remember. The Game of Life has sold over 70 million copies in 59 countries, and was even inducted into the permanent archives of family life at the Smithsonian Institution. In 2005, Rubin was inducted into the Toy Industry Hall of Fame, and in 2009, he received the People of Play's Toy and Game International Excellence Award for Lifetime Achievement. Countless licensed versions of the game have been produced, and the fun of Rubin's game has been spun off into everything from tablet apps and even a TV game show. In 2010, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Game of Life and to honor its inventor, Hasbro commissioned a portrait of Rubin and immortalized him as only the makers of G.I. Joe could. They turned him into an action figure. The tribute celebrated Rubin's service as a naval combat officer and honored him as, quote, a true toy icon, a man who is undoubtedly a winner at the real game of life. Whether the goal is to reach happy old age, the wealthiest wins, or maybe even to entertain billions of people, the fun lies in the journey taken, something that Milton Bradley and Rubin Klamer both knew very well. Ruben and I spoke on the phone several months ago in the hopes that he would join me in an interview for this video. It was not meant to be. Ruben Klamer passed away last month, September 14th, at the happy old age of 99. When he hit that birthday milestone last June, he had just finished his yet-to-be-published memoir, Blitz, Sizzle, and Serendipity, My Game of Life. I, for one, can't wait to read more about a life well lived.